How is Max suddenly the best character in Stranger Things? I'm shocked. I really did not like this character in Season 2. Season 3 was a big improvement. But then Max in Season 4 just demolished my expectations. Everything with her was done so well. And it's weird. I feel like we see characters in shows get ruined a lot, but how often is it that we see a character get fixed? So let's figure this out. Gotta start with what's broken with Max in Season 2, and there's a lot, unfortunately. So let me start by showing you two scenes. Well, well, voila! <laughs> cool, right? No? Okay. Holy shit! Shit, you should have seen the look on your faces. And you? Who screams like that? You sound like a little girl. <gasps> hey, you guys coming or not? Ooh, I heard we should hit up Loch Nora. That's where the rich people live, right? <laughs> These are two different characters. We have aloof, annoyed loner girl who wants nothing to do with the group in scene one, and then we have this very social girl who's eager to join the group in scene two. This is kind of a confusing intro for a new character. And to be clear, it's okay for characters to have a diverse range of behavior and emotions and affects. And it's not just okay, it's good. This is a big part of giving characters depth. But the big pitfall here is presenting a confusing picture instead of a complex one. You don't want your audience walking away feeling like they missed something. And the idea here is to create some kind of clear unity between the different parts of the character. One way to do that is to show the transition from one mode to the other. Nancy season one is a great example of this. A little bit less of a complex conflict, but still we have Nancy one and then we have Nancy two. Seems pretty different. But we see how she goes from one mode to the other. Another thing to do here is to show hints of one mode in the other mode. When Nancy, the way she shotguns the beer is shy and a little awkward. And we get this right afterwards, this interaction with Barb. And this is Nancy herself trying to unite those two modes, trying to juggle them, trying to navigate that complexity. And the more we show this nuanced interplay, the sooner we start to form a unified theory on the character, no backstory needed at all. And my favorite example of the skipping ahead a bit is Max, but season 4 Max. How does a character who puts up a lot of barriers between herself and her friends have a vulnerable moment with them? She doesn't, she finds a way to keep her walls up and have her vulnerability too. Beautiful mixing of the two modes, beautiful unity here. But season 2 Max is just abruptly annoyed Max in one scene to jokey Max in the other. No transition, no hint of Max 1 and Max 2 at all. And yeah, I know they try, but I don't think it works, it's not clear enough. And the same issue comes up with her relationship with Billy. He seemingly doesn't care about her at all one moment, and then the next he's super controlling. He's trying to tell her who she can and cannot hang out with. It's very jarring. There's no transition, no hints between the two modes. Max herself seems confused by this. Of course the audience is going to be confused. Why do you care? And later on they do supply some of the unity we're looking for through backstory. We have this scene with Max. You no, know, I can be a jerk like him sometimes. And I do not want to be like him. And then we get this scene with Billy and his father where we see where that behavior comes from. And these scenes are fine, they're okay. We get some humanity here, we get some relatability, we get some depth. But the problem even here is that we don't see the basis for either conflict expressed outside of these scenes for either character. And it comes kind of late. If we're not invested in the character up until now, explaining what already didn't invest us is a tough path for generating more engagement. Okay, so that's problem number one with season two Max, messy complexity, late depth. Second problem with season two Max is that she doesn't really matter. What does Max do exactly? What is her role in relation to the plot? It's kind of awkward trying to figure this out. You look at season one, we see very clear plot roles. Mike is the leader. He makes the decisions. He holds most of the agency in the group. Dustin is bursting with support energy. Lucas is usually dissent. By later seasons, we see characters like Nancy becoming the investigator. Steve is in charge of bravery and brute force. New characters like Robin and Erica are mostly there to bring colorful new attitudes and character dynamics, but they also bring along certain skills that have function in the plot. Even Eddie in season four is this passively vital character in the plot. He's a focal point. With all these characters, we see a clear difference between what the plot gains if they are there and what it loses if they are aren't. So what function does Max offer to the ensemble? Even she doesn't seem to know. I could be your Zoomer. Easy Max, you're clearly Gen X. But yeah, it's played for laughs, so what would the answer be? It kind of feels like Max is just along for the ride this season. And granted, yeah, Lucas brings her to see the demi-dogs, that's a plot thing. But imagine if Max doesn't exist, Lucas probably would have been there with Dustin and Steve already. So again, not much changes without her. We also have Billy coming around looking for her at the end, maybe you'll say this is an effect she has. But again, take that scene out and not much changes. Which is crazy by the way, because that's Max's most important scene, it's the resolution solution to her character arc, and it's completely disconnected from the rest of the season's plot, and almost entirely disconnected from any other character's arc. It plays a role with Steve fine, but that's it. So season two, we introduce two brand new characters, and neither of them plays a necessary role in anything that happens external to them in the whole season. Their relationship with each other, their arcs, or Max's arc, Billy doesn't really have one, none of it integrates at all into the plot. Now, that's not to say we don't miss anything if we delete Max. She does serve some character purposes for the other characters, that's fine. She creates friction in the group, that's very important. The characters around her have very clear dynamics with her. We see her intriguing and attracting Dustin and Lucas. We see her inclusion in the group making Mike upset. We see her interaction with Mike making Eleven jealous. So isn't that the kind of functionality I was looking for? She has a pretty clear impact on the character level, can't deny that. But there's still something important missing here. The problem is that none of these effects on the other characters have to do with Max the person with who she is. Lucas's attraction, Mike's bitterness, Elle's jealousy, these dynamics have nothing to do with her core characteristics. They all kind of come from non-essential stuff about her. She attracts and intrigues, she causes jealousy, etc. 
etc. because she's a girl, because she's new, because she has arcade skills, and yeah, that's a bit warmer despite it not really having much relevance after this. But even with that, think about what this means. It means you could swap Max out for any girl character with any personality, and as long as she's new in town and good at Dig Dug, she'll still intrigue and attract Dustin and Lucas, she'll still make Mike upset, she'll still make Elle jealous. Doesn't have to be Max, could be anyone, which is a problem. You're introducing a new character here. Her personality, her relationships, her backstory should matter more in how she impacts the story, but it really doesn't at all. And I think this segues perfectly into what started making her character work, because in future seasons, all of these core character traits absolutely do matter in everything she does. So let's go to season 3. What first opens up Max's character is her friendship with Elle. Max is perfect for this role. Because Elle is still pretty new to real life stuff, she still feels awkward and intimidated. And who better than Max to guide Eleven through all of this? Independent Max who can help Elle take charge of her life, no nonsense Max who won't judge Elle for being new to all these things because who the heck cares what people think, streetwise Max who has more life experience than any of the boys who are all kind of sheltered, suburban, middle-class, white picket fence types. Season 3L is about developing an identity. Max is very comfortable with who she is. Season 3L needs to be taught how to have fun. Max knows exactly how to have fun. Season 3L struggles with Hopper. Max knows exactly how to handle people like that. Max can help her with it. Do you knock? Jeez. Yeah. Jeez. Oh. Great choice for a buddy relationship. And just as important, Season 3 we have a plot which absolutely involves Max and is impacted by Max. Because the main antagonist of the season is Billy, sort of. Which means Max has the highest stake in the season's plot. Billy's antagonist role isn't just threatening to Hawkins on like a plot level, it's personal for Max. The monster is her brother. It's terrible for her. It's confusing for her. It's tragic. This dynamic of theirs and its complexity now completely integrated into everything. Take the sauna scene, think about how much less power that scene has if this is just a random person. We get all of these beautifully harsh layers of Max facing this person she fears, but also her dealing with the guilt over hurting a family member, and confusion because this guy is very emotionally abusive to her, but he's her brother and she feels compassionate also because of that. Now we're actually seeing the conflict clearly. We're getting the transition between all these complicated parts of this. And through this, the plot is developing as Billy and Max's relationship is deepening. And by the end, from both sides, they have to reconcile as siblings on a character level in order for us to feel ready plot-wise for the story to reach resolution. Super integrated, and the resolution packs a much greater punch because it's resolving character and plot arcs in one go. Okay, now we get to season four. And we gotta take a step back here and talk about tragedy first. Question is, what turns bad stuff happening into tragedy? Tragedy. In my opinion, it's injustice. Take like an eight-year-old kid, kill their mom, that's bad stuff happening. Kill the dad too, kill the older siblings, that's just unfair, that's wrong. For me, that's what makes it tragedy. Here, season four's tragedy move with Vecna's curse is that he takes these characters who already have had terrible things happen to them, trauma that no one should have to deal with, and it's those people he murders. As if their lives weren't tortured enough already, now we have the people suffering the most, they're the ones singled out and targeted. That is an extra level of sad. And that, I think, is what makes Max such a compelling target this season. We really feel for her because she's already had the hardest life of any of these characters. Her family life already sucked as a kid, she had this unrelentingly horrible relationship with her brother, and then the moment when things finally maybe turn a corner, she loses him. Imagine if Dustin was Vecna's target. It would feel unfair, sure, but it would be the unfairness of randomness, like fate rolled a dice and it landed on him. With Max, we feel the cruelty of fate, the injustice, the tragedy of her already hard life ending this way. I mean, of course this asshole curses me. Should have seen that one coming. And the way she's resigned to her fate is also a reaction to this only she could have. It's all those challenging years giving her this resilience to accept her fate, to understand what she needs for closure, and to go about it in this very pragmatic, Max-like, no-nonsense way. Which stands out, it's pretty admirable, we respect it. Our theme for this character really grows by seeing this reaction. Okay, so, up until now, at this point in the season, we have a very, very good character. But then we go to great with the running up that hill scene. Hands down the best scene in the season, oh my god. So I want to talk about the scene from three different angles. Character, plot world building, and the scene itself, just like the composition of the scene. Character, okay, so so much happens so quickly here. First of all, all of that strength we just talked about, all that resilience, her cool, calm, admirable acceptance of her fate. They begin the scene with a closer look at that, and what we see is a facade. Not necessarily the bad kind of a facade, we're withholding judgment, but we see just enough to glimpse the vulnerability lurking there. This is someone pointedly hiding their feelings. Someone not wanting to appear weak in front of others, Max has this wall between her and everyone else, and she seems afraid to let anyone in behind her wall. And we're led quickly into the scene showing what is behind the wall, with her reading Billy's letter. It's a beautiful moment. She really pours her heart out, but not in this overly emotional way, it's a very Max way. And just to mention as an aside, this goes to show that just because a character dies doesn't mean the relationships have to stop developing. Max's relationship with her brother is what's driving all of this, despite him being dead. It's not just relevant, it's still evolving, it's changing Max, it's affecting her in new ways. And it's really moving what we learn about how this relationship impacts her beyond the grave. Knowing Max has this loner side of herself, knowing how hard it is for her to let people 
brain and be close to them. Hearing her say that all she really wanted was to have a normal brother-sister relationship with Billy is heartbreaking. And then hearing her scold herself for being childish for even wanting that is also heartbreaking. The scene deepens the tragedy aspect, but also keeps upping our admiration for her. She's not just a strong character who faces death without protest. No, she has a heart too. She's forgiving, and she has the seemingly irrational but also really human guilt. Max is a good person. But then Vecna arrives on the scene and turns everything we just learned on its head. Because Vecna thinks that all the stuff in the letter was also a facade, and this time the bad kind of facade. It's a lie. It's an act so Max can hide from seeing her own darkness. Vecna exposes the real vulnerability hiding behind the previous vulnerabilities. He shows us what is lurking behind this facade behind a facade. You know, I think there's a part of you buried somewhere deep that wanted me to die that day. That was maybe even relieved. And that's exactly that same fear that we know Max has because she told us about it in season two. Max is terrified that she's a bad person, that she's no different from the other bad people in her life. And that thought of if she is this fear that she might be, that provides this twisted expose of what we thought was strength, what we begin to suspect was a front in a whole new way, and a really grim way. That <laughs> is why you feel such guilt. No. Why you hide from your friends. No. Why you hide from the world. No. And why late at night. You have sometimes wished to follow me. And now we have a character with some real big boy depth. We have questions about who Max really is, questions we don't have the answer to. Is Vecna's theory right that all this is repressed darkness and fear of that darkness and self-annihilating wishes caused by that darkness? Or is she really strong and resilient and can we believe everything she said in her letter? Deep down, did she want to save Billy or did she want Billy to die? Why does she have these walls up between her and her friends? And we also have questions not about the character, questions in general that this character makes us ask. Does it make you a bad person to wish death upon your abuser. Could Max and Billy have had that fresh start? Can people start over like that? Can those relationships heal? If you see my more ambiguity video, these are the categories I explain more fully there. These kinds of unanswerable questions are what gives the story over to the audience to participate in. This is the part that we decide, that we discuss. These are the blanks that we fill in. It invests us in a totally different way. And now we get to what Max does with all this, how she reacts, how she navigates this dark revelation about herself. And this is where the awesomeness and world building comes in, which also relates to the thing that gives the scene so much power on the plot level because on a character level this grim reveal about Max's inner self is mortifying. But on a plot level she's gonna die so literally mortifying too. But then instead we get one of my favorite things ever in fiction when it's pulled off correctly. I love when the plot makes us feel that something is impossible or even explicitly tells us that it's impossible and then somehow finds a believable way to empower a character to do the impossible. Think of the Matrix with the agents who are impossible to kill but they lay the groundwork to give Neo the ability to find it within himself to do the impossible. Also One Piece spoilers for Spondi Archipelago arc, I won't say much, but a certain kick is a great example of this. Back to Stranger Things, here we have this precedent said that to us seems utterly hopeless. How do you possibly stop this final gruesome fatal stage of the curse? You can't fight it, there's nothing to fight, the other characters cannot interact at all, and we don't have Eleven to help either. But this cannot be allowed to happen, we cannot lose Max, she has to survive. And in moments like these, when the audience is this desperate and the story generates a solution, it is such sweet catharsis. It's like we ourselves are being rescued by fate. The universe is opening up a path. It's as if our fears and our hopes and desperation change the course of the future and save this character we care about. And that is exactly what happens here. The story generates a sliver of hope. And that's important, just a sliver. This is not some magical Vecna be gone spray. And it's also not out of nowhere either. That's vital. Groundwork must be laid for this stuff or it's just plot armor. It's Dave Sex Machina. It's unjustified, inorganic, and dumb. But Stranger Things did lay the groundwork. They put a lot of work into making us understand that there was someone who survived this in the past. We have a precedent. This is not out of nowhere. And it's a solution that still requires effort from Max on a practical level, and also effort on a deeper level. This scene requires a pivotal character moment for Max, because we have that wall that's always been there between Max and her friends, and with Vecna's theory, yes, it's gotten worse because part of Max is running from them. She's turning away from the people who care about her. And what she tells herself is strength. She's choosing isolation. She's choosing death, because part of her feels like she deserves it. The music opens the door, and Max has to choose life. Max has to to choose her friend, she has to run towards them. She has to embrace those bonds. And we get this scene, this perfectly constructed, multi-layered masterpiece of a scene. And let me break down all the components here. In stories, we feel emotions most strongly when there's a journey from one extreme all the way to the opposite. And here we get this sprint from hopelessness to hope. We get this montage of everything urging Max to choose life rushing through her consciousness. All of these emotionally charged moments too fast for us to even keep up. And we're getting opposites now. In this moment of desperation and doom, we get funny moments and happy moments. All these 
ancillary emotional journeys to accompany us from hopelessness to hope. And this hope concretizes itself in a physical portal and this path Max has to run so we really feel it. And we're also getting all this sensory overload, the symbolic stuff everywhere. Max is dodging chunks of darkness as the world caves in, tries to stop her from reaching the light. The music is telling her to keep running, keep running, all culminating in this triumphant moment of her escaping fate and being the arms of the friend she chose over an early tragic guilt-driven death. Oh man, so powerful. For any of you who've seen my video on writing powerful scenes, this is a fantastic level 9 scene. I'm sure you heard me running through each level just now, it's so well done. And this character has one last major beat in part 2 of the season. She volunteers to be bait, and I've been fascinated by exactly this kind of self-sacrifice lately. I talked about this in numerous arcane videos with the Undercity characters, but the idea of people who have been treated so cruelly by life as to feel disposable, finding empowerment in that, people with less ego, with lower self-worth, people who have had terrible lives, the idea that that grants this superpower almost, to be able to step forward and give up their existence to a cause they think is worthy, knowing the cost and accepting it, that is so cool to me, so empowering, so admirable. And that is Max, whether or not it's a facade, whether or not Vecna's right, practically it's still strength and she has so much of it. Like I said before, the rest of these kids have good lives and they are brave, but their courage comes from youthful naivete if anything. Whereas Max's brand of strength comes from the life she's lived. It comes from this not dramatic, not egotistical, fairly low level of self-worth that she's willing to essentially weaponize against Vecna. Uniquely Max, perfect role for her. And obviously very curious place to leave her in at the end of the season, full of potential for seeing new sides of her, I'm sure lots of new vulnerabilities, and also interesting plot stuff if she's still in the upside down somewhere. Definitely looking forward to that. But anyway, it's that running scene that really clinches it for me. I don't know about you. I love me some Dustin. Still retains the title of most fun character in the show. I and he had the best scene of the previous season. Super weird scene, but amazing scene nonetheless. Steve, fantastic character, had my personal favorite scene of season one. Hopper, really cool guy, really admirable guy. Mike loved him in season one, and that's kind of it. But yeah, Max just shot ahead of all of them this season. She really is currently the best character in the show, in my opinion, and that's something I never thought I'd hear myself say. Anyway, subscribe if you want to see more Stranger Things content. I don't really have a specific plan here. I might make more if there's interest. I have a few ideas, but I was also in the middle of making a Game of Thrones arcane comparison when I stopped to make this, so I don't know. We'll figure it out. Support me on Patreon. Shout out to everyone there, means the world. And specifically, I want to shout out this week Thomas Nevery and External Cyberbrain. Thanks so much for the higher tier subscriptions, but thanks to everyone for the support. Shorts coming this week, subscribe for that, and thanks for watching.